This is a community vital conversation. I'm David Martin Davies from Texas Public Radio's The Source. Texas Public Radio is teaming up with the John L. Santico's Charitable Foundation, a fund of the San Antonio Area Foundation, for a series of discussions about key areas in our community. Today, we're focused on aging strong through COVID-19 and beyond. Other topics for conversations include youth success, livable and resilient communities, and cultural vibrancy. These are all San Antonio Area Foundation impact areas. We're building on the discussion that we had on the radio on The Source yesterday on Texas Public Radio, talking about the needs of our seniors and how they've been impacted by COVID-19. Even in the best of times, many seniors are dealing with housing issues, food insecurity, economic hardship, social isolation, transportation problems, and more. But in this pandemic, where the vast majority of deaths are those of 65 and older, we definitely need to be thinking about the needs of our older population and aging strong, and what can we learn now to help us deal with the post-pandemic world. In today's discussion, we'll be focusing on how local nonprofit organizations are helping San Antonio seniors thrive. And for those listening online, if you have a question, you can go ahead and participate by typing your questions in the box and we'll get that to our panelists and we'll discuss that. And this is a discussion. We definitely wanna hear from everyone. Panelists jump in here as we talk about uh, issues of aging strong, thriving here in San Antonio. Let's introduce our panelists. We're joined by Cadence Corbin, an older adults program officer for the San Antonio Area Foundation. Cadence, it's good to have you. Welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. Vincent Ferris is with us, CEO of Meals on Wheels San Antonio. Vincent Ferris, it's good to have you. Thank you, sir. Looking forward to it. Deanne Quare joins us, the Texas State Director for Older Adults Technology Services, OATS, and Senior Planet San Antonio. Deanne Quare, it's good to have you. Thank you, David. And Marisa Bono joins us, Chief Strategic Officer for Via Metropolitan Transit. Marisa Bono, it's good to have you. Good to be here, thank you. So, uh, Cadence Corbin, if you could start us off here with the San Antonio Area Foundation and tell us how the Area Foundation recognizes that we have special needs in San Antonio we have to address with our older population and what is happening dealing with this pandemic, COVID-19? Yeah, I, I can start off, off start us off that question. Um, you know, the Area Foundation has made a strong commitment the past several years to create an ecosystem of support that honors our older adult world, um, from serving nonprofits to uh, thinking about advocacy and policy to thinking about uh, collaborative efforts through our strategic initiative, SALSA, um, Successfully Aging and Living in San Antonio. We're looking at significant ways to invest in our older adults and older San Antonians locally and, and the eight surrounding counties. Um, we do that through funding opportunities. Uh, we also do that through collaborative efforts, like I just mentioned. Um, but we, you know, we don't have boots on the ground. So our, a lot of our work is geared towards supporting our nonprofits who are day in and day out working programmatically to serve our older adults in San Antonio. Boots on the ground. There's a lot of other people who have boots on the ground or even wheels on the ground. Let's go to, to Vincent Ferris, at the CEO of Meals on Wheels San Antonio. And even pre-pandemic, we know that Meals on Wheels was operating at high capacity. Uh, and what, is, what has changed? Everything has changed. Nothing is the same, David. I tell you, can you believe we have, have been doing this uh, for as, as long as we have now? I mean, nine months is is crazy but uh, but even then you were like 40 years in meals on wheels san antonio right yes yes the uh you know we 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 have always been the personal touch uh, knock on the door across the threshold in people's homes going in and, and welcoming us in such a way you know we uh, there was an unbelievable level of trust and uh our folks had already uh, self-quarantined and isolated by circumstance and so when when people were, were encouraged to shelter in place at the early stages of the pandemic, our, the majority of people that we served had already done that simply because they had to. Uh, what, what changed though was uh, the, the distance between us. And so we had to keep things safe where we were seeing people daily. We reduced the number of days that we actually delivered meals to them. 
uh, from five days a week, we're only going two days. From hot meals, we started taking chilled meals, but multiple meals at a time. We were taking at least three at a time, sometimes as, as many as six. In the early days, we, of course, didn't know how long the, the pandemic would, would be going. We didn't know when, how and when it might affect our shop and our ability to get food out. So initially, <clears throat> excuse me, we had to get food out there as quickly as we can and, and as much in the homes as we could. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we've, we've hit kind of a, a plateau here knowing what we're doing. It's not quite the craziness and having to react on, on a, you know, a second's notice uh, as we were in the early days. But uh, we, we hang food on door handles, ring the bell, take six steps back and wait for them to come to the door. We don't want to call it social isolation. I mean, it's a physical distancing there, but it is so important to see these people and still be able to visit with them. But now we're mumbling at them through a mask. They can't see all of our face, maybe some smiles in our eyes, maybe not, but it's such a different experience. But we're still out there, still doing what we were before pandemic, just in many, many different ways. Vincent, pre-pandemic, your numbers were, were what, about 3,000 meals per day? Yes, yes. And now we have, we have jumped up to over four on some days. Uh, early stages, our, our phones were ringing off the wall. Our interest list grew to over 1,500. Where we used to go out and do in-home assessments, we have to go to virtual assessments. And a lot of those people uh, initially calling were people who were scared, couldn't get to the grocery store. But our services are for those really who can't prepare a meal for themselves. And uh, so it's, it, it's leveled back down. Uh, one of the things that's happened though, and where we had so many referrals coming in early on, uh, they have slowed down. Uh, referrals normally come from uh, hospitals, social workers, home health agencies, uh, places where seniors go, just to the clinics. People don't go to the doctor these days like they used to. So those referrals have really, really slowed down. And so uh, we, we, have, we have slipped back a little. Uh, we're a little different from others in the community though, because our folks who are isolated, so they're unseen and people don't see them behind those closed doors. So it's easy for us to forget about them. And if they're not able to get out and about, they can't access these other services in the community that are available. So, uh, you know, why, why I have a captive audience and a few people listening to me here, I do encourage people to, to refer people to us if they think that, that they are in need of, of a assistance for Meals on Wheels. Vincent, how has the San Antonio Area Foundation been able to support you during this time? Well, the biggest thing was right off the bat in the early days when we had no clue how we were going to pay for what we were doing. We were trying to be the best first responders that we could be and, and running toward the, the accident there. Uh, the San Antonio Area Foundation came in with some very generous funding, and that encouraged others in the community to follow suit. Uh, if the Area Foundation is supporting a cause, others take note and say, hey, that must be something we should check into. So they have been right there. They have been one of the ones encouraging the collaborative efforts that, that we all should be doing, but sometimes we get in our ruts and don't do, we, do that nearly as much as we should. So it, it's been very helpful in, uh, in new partnerships that we didn't have uh, prior to the pandemic. Yeah, we've all been so overwhelmed and everyone's trying to keep themselves you know, above water and it's hard to focus on what needs to be done. And when we have leadership, we can, we can address these issues. Uh, so, uh, Deanne Cuellar, at the Texas State um, D Director for Older Adults Technology Services, OATS, and Senior Planet San Antonio, uh, so much has shifted online these days, virtual experiences, virtual socialization, but we know that older adults don't frequently have uh, all of the online uh, infrastructure or even the know-how to engage. Is that where you're trying to fill the gaps? Yes, so Oats and, San Antonio, um, Oats and Senior Plan of San Antonio works at the intersection of aging and technology. So people might know us as the organization that's helping older adults get on get online, but what we're truly trying to do is end social isolation and ageism. And um, we, we've identified over 22 million seniors um, through uh, 250 data sets over the last 15 years. So there are upwards of 22 million seniors in the United States that are um, one, socially isolated, but not living with a computer or an internet device. 
And in, in San Antonio, we've been working with San Antonio Area Foundation and organizations such as Meals on Wheels um, and other partners to I, identify those seniors who might benefit from joining a program like Senior Plan at San Antonio. What's the primary uh, technology device that seniors will use to connect? So we are um, advocates of a high quality device, whether that is a smart tablet with a large screen or a laptop that's a high quality laptop. We uh, focus on new devices and low cost devices, um, depending on what the, the seniors needs. 72% of seniors live with some sort of disability. So um, a tablet might be easier to carry versus a laptop or easier to to um, to hold, um, and then we also work with them all the way from the beginning of you know um, how to buy a computer, which computer is best for them, and then we also walk them through all the different internet service providers available to them in their zip code and which one is best based on their income. Right. So uh, people doing more on online virtual interactions, Zoom meetings, uh, meetings just like this one can't do it in person because of the virus. Uh, and we even knew before the virus that there was uh, a epidemic of social isolation for many of our older uh, adults. And so are we able to figure out uh, a systems now that we can learn from into the future in order to break down social isolation uh, now and in, into the future? So pre-COVID, we were working on a concept that some people thought you know, was contradictory, contradictory to like what they had known about seniors willing to adopt technology. We had two really great ideas and one was to launch a virtual call center tech support line with highly skilled technology trainers, the same trainers they would see in person at the senior centers. And the other was a senior planet in a box, which was an all inclusive, you know, beautiful drop shipped, you know, device connected to the internet. And so we've spent the last eight months launching the virtual call center we handle incoming calls and we respond to out you know outgoing calls to people that we miss and um we walk you know if a senior comes through us they usually come through us through a catalyst partner you know catalyst partner relationship um like similar to meals on wheels by referral you know we'll take them from being on the phone all the way through that first time we see them pop up, pop up on Zoom, and then where they go from there, um, you know, is different. And and um, before Christmas, around 300 seniors in, in the Bear County area will be receiving um, an LG tablet connected to one year of free internet, and that's theirs. The tablet is theirs to keep. The internet is available at no cost, and so we're we're going after 300 seniors that we've identified that are very vulnerable, very isolated, no one's seen them in months, and we're gonna do the field work to get them online. Right, so the issue that a lot of people have when it comes to gaining access to the internet, if you don't have the internet, then you can't find out about programs like the one you're offering, uh, this amazing 300 devices uh, program, and then getting people connected. So do we need others who are connected to be advocates, to rope in others that they think could benefit from these types of projects? Well, this is where the Salsa, uh, Salsa Initiative and the San Antonio Area Foundation came in as the, you know, the catalyzing, you know, node or resource in our community. You know, we, we you know, being a part of Salsa, we were like, we've got two really great ideas. And if we, if we, if we can deploy these two really great ideas, you know, who, who would we work with? And, you know, Salsa has already done the work. They've already power mapped who are the people working on transportation, housing, and social isolation, and who are the caregivers? So through the South Initiative and, and this, with the support of the San Antonio Area Foundation, we were quickly able to identify like which nonprofits to partner with. And not only in this process did we like identify like the seniors through their data collection, but we also, while we were at it, we were just like, we have these 12 organizations that also want to transition to online environments. So then we took what we knew and, and we did capacity building sessions with these organizations so that they could they too could join us in the online environment to meet seniors where they were. Now, over at uh, Via Metropolitan Transit, Marisa Bono, the chief strategic officer, we know that transportation is a major challenge for many of our seniors as they're no longer, many of them are not, not able to drive. Uh, but what is happening at, at VIA? Uh, VIA has been dealing with COVID-19, also uh, helping seniors, uh, finding ways to innovate. What, what is going on? 
you for that. And I, it, I mean, it's really a critical point that you, you raised, David, before COVID, Via did a survey. We wanted to know who our riders were. And we found out that almost 70% of our riders live a low, uh, live above the federal poverty uh, line. And in addition to that, almost 20% um, are seniors or 60 and older. And so for us as an agency, figuring out how to serve folks who don't have access to reliable transportation, um, who don't necessarily have access to programs to uh, bring them nutrition or help them get to their doctor's visits, um, help them go about their day-to-day life, but also how to do it um, safely. It was a really critical issue for us. Um, we know that transit is safer than driving, especially for seniors statistically. Um, it, it's safer for folks who are commuting or making those essential trips. And in addition to that, more importantly, it's less expensive than driving. Um, we Here in San Antonio, we um, know that one of the number one reasons that seniors miss their doctor's visits is lack of access to reliable transportation because they're on fixed income. So getting the word out about our reduced rates on fares and passes, our reduced rates for seniors, but also getting in place a protocol that ensures safety on our buses. So we upped our cleaning frequency, um, sanitizing. Uh, we also instituted a 16 rider limit on our, uh, on our, our regular buses. Um, and also uh, tried to engage in educational efforts that were not reliant on Wi-Fi. So we instituted a teletown hall series, uh, which allows folks to participate and get information using the phone. You don't need Wi-Fi at all. And through that mechanism, we were able to reach almost 30,000 individuals here in San Antonio, primarily by the telephone at all. And people could call in live and interact, ask questions about our safety protocol, how to access our free and reduced fare. Um, and of course, we partnered very closely with uh, OAS and with the San Antonio Area Foundation and with with SAUSA um, to ensure that that coordination was happening. I've heard a lot about um, partnerships. I don't, I don't know where we are on this, but uh, I've heard that there, it had been in the works with uh, Rideshare for uh, VIA. And um, is that for the last mile or for people who have ambulatory issues getting to a bus line? Or is that still happening, Marisa? Absolutely, we have a we have a rideshare program in place, uh, but more importantly, with the recent passage of funding to support our Keep Us a Moving plan, we'll be able to expand our mobility on demand service, which will be especially beneficial for seniors. So, for those of uh, for those who are listening right now who aren't familiar with mobility on demand, in May of 2019, Via introduced its Via Link service as a pilot in the Northeast uh, 13 mile zone in the, on the Northeast side, side of San Antonio. And it operates a lot like rideshare, like Uber or Lyft. You can uh, summon a smaller vehicle uh, through an, either through an app on your phone or through dial-in on your phone. And within 30 minutes, a driver will come and take you to where you wanna go um, within the zone. So unfortunately, because of funding limitations, VIA couldn't expand that service, even though it was very successful. Um, and with this additional funding, we'll now be able to start expansion into 13 additional on-demand zones um, throughout the city. So uh, important, again, for those who are on fixed incomes but have those mobility challenges, uh, half a mile for the folks on this call may not be that far of a walk, but for someone who's using a walker or a cane, it can be pretty daunting, especially in this, this cold weather. And so having an option um, that has uh, flexibility and is also safe uh, and low cost, uh, you can summon a Via Link ride for the cost of a bus fare. So definitely competitive with ride share when you don't have to pay those ride share prices. Um, it, that's, that's a service we think will be especially beneficial as we try to help transition seniors through the crisis and then later through recovery. Uh, Cadence Corbin with the San Antonio Area Foundation as you're the adults 
older adults program officer. What I'm hearing from these three different non uh, three different organizations from from Via, from Wheels on Wheels, and from Oats Senior Plan at San Antonio, they're all offering ways. But I, I I'm already thinking about how they intersect and how they sort of um, when they, if they can work together, so much more can be accomplished. So do you see? what you're doing at the San Antonio Area Foundation is looking at their strengths. I mean, so Meals on Wheels, such a trusted program, you know, and then we're talking about, well, here's this new thing that V is talking about, and people may be a little re little uh, suspicious, reluctant to get on board a, a new drive share type of car share type thing. But if, and, and then also, uh, Dion, with the, with the oats and the training, because there's some computer tech involved, all of these things kind of have to work together in order to maximize the potential of the success. So are you sort of working to, to, to deliver that? Yeah, I will um, I'll say that these organizations are doing phenomenal work. Uh, I'll think, I, what I think is that through Salsa, um, the collaboration has been compounded. I think that the network adaptability of those who are involved in our Salsa network was incredibly quick and responsive to the needs of our older adults um, through COVID. Uh, I remember within the first week of COVID coming online, um, because we had salsa in place, because we had um, a program, a, a base camp where people could communicate and, and talk and share resources and ideas quickly and with fluidity, that problems were probably being solved much quicker. Um, and organizations were adapting um, with more thought in place because they had these thought partners that were working strategically alongside of them. This morning, we did a reflection with about 12 of our partners through salsa. And the biggest reflection they had from this past year was that um, they they were able to to pivot their programs to online and virtual so much quicker. Half of that was due to, to Oats uh, helping those organizations go online that, that previously were not. And so I think that absolutely the work of intersectionality and how these organizations work together and how that network and ecosystem benefits the broader community um, is a pivotal role of Salsa. And we wanna continue to affirm that we trust our partners to do their work and our job as a funder is to continue to support financially and through um, forums and hosting conversations that are important to the work that they do. I have a question for Meals on Wheels for one of our viewers. Uh, so um, Vincent, according to the individual uh, Danielle, I work with a local nonprofit and we sometimes prefer our older adults to uh, be set up for your services. Some of them tell us they have difficulty getting set up and I'm sure the demand is high. Sometimes our callers can be confused, forgetful, so it's not always easy to tell what's actually going on in a particular situation. Can you please tell us what the turnaround time is for a new intake? It all depends on the individual uh, referral coming in. If someone needs services uh, like immediately, they are isolated, no assistance, no family nearby, no way to access food, really need someone coming in and checking on them, we can get them on service in a matter of just a few days. Uh, at high times uh, of calls coming in like we have here in the holiday season, it could be backed up. And right now we are a bit backed up. Our main thing is to encourage people to uh, to, to be patient, but to be persistent. Sometimes we do drop the ball and I, I apologize for that, but stick with us and we're gonna do the best we can to get them out. Um, it's amazing how the call volume increases during the holidays each year. It's more community awareness of, of people that they haven't seen all year and people will start making referrals, uh, family members or, or a neighbor or something like that. Uh, this year, it, since we hit uh, uh, Thanksgiving, really the week before Thanksgiving, our call volume has just jumped uh, sky high. And, and part of that, I think, has to do with the rise in uh, COVID across the country. And, but, uh, you know, stick with us. We we get to them eventually. Deanna Cuellar, with the uh, Senior Plan at San Antonio, um, a lot of people during the holidays, they'll upgrade their technology. Uh, they still have a perfectly good laptop or tablet that they have. Can those things be donated to, to you guys? Are you aware, able to repurpose uh, still operating technology? It's just not this year's most high-tech high item? We, from our experience, um, the amount of time to refurbish a laptop and do the software hardware updates for um, an older adult user that's not going to be able to do that, um, at, it just doesn't turn, you know, just the cost, it's not cost effective for us. 
what, so what, what we do so that people understand, um, you know, the tablet with connected to the internet or the devices that we work very closely with corporate partners like Verizon, T-Mobile, Comcast, um, you know, um, depending on your geography, Spectrum or AT&T. So all the internet service providers, you know, we work with them and we work with other partners in the, the communities where we um, have a senior planet program to decide, you know, what, what resources are available and what tablet or device makes most, most sense um, and connect to the internet. Um, and that's that's how we've been doing it for uh, several years. And, um, you know, go, going forward as an organization, since we've now grown, you know, across more than seven geographies, is we, um, we're gonna focus more on showing organizations how to do that, like how to build those relationships with, um, you know, internet service providers or companies that make devices so that they know how to procure them for their communities, whether it's a low density community or a community like the city of San Antonio. So um, the technology that is available to many people, I read that 40% of adults over 70 have no internet access. This is an area that is a group and demographic that is in, in that uh, digital divide. And so this is the challenge for you, especially now that so much has moved online, including socialization, online banking, uh, shopping. Uh, you're saying, here's your solution. Don't go to the grocery store, go online. If you're not online, you don't have a lot of options. So how do you deal with that, Deanne? Well, the uh, seniors are on a fixed income. The majority of the seniors that are the organizations on this call um, you know, work with are um, on a fixed income or some don't no longer have an income coming in. So the idea of you know, spending money on a, a bundle of services is not within their budget. Uh, so again, it's back to working with you know everybody in the sandbox, the the companies and you know the communities working, the municipalities and so forth, to identify um, where the low cost internet options are because they exist, but they're not very visible, and there hasn't been a lot of uh, public information put out there on how to reach them. And so that call center that I mentioned, um, if a senior calls them, you know we work with them, that we plug in their zip code, and we first find out you know, a little bit more about them to to even to see if there is a program of an affordable Internet program available to them and if they qualify uh, for that program. Um, I back to the person that was talking about, like, I've tried to apply for Meals on Wheels and, you know, they, they didn't navigate the process like it is. A, it is a process to navigate. And I think all of our organizations, um, we don't just point to a program that's available. Like we really, really do try to work with a customer or constituent to to stop and help navigate through the navigate them through that program so that they know how to navigate that program like you know it's that literacy of like how do you apply for a snap benefit which results in you qualifying for a low-cost internet option and really making sure that they have that literacy and those training tools in their toolbox so that it's systems level change like you now have a senior that knows how to apply for programs on the internet and knows which ones they qualify for yeah, we had the San Antonio um, Senior Centers from the city of San Antonio. It was a great place to have uh, contact with individuals, uh, do training and outreach and build relationships and trust, uh, do health services as well. Um, and because of COVID-19 and uh, the shutting down of some of these services, it's uh, it, it's been very difficult. So uh, Marisa Bono, bus drivers, you know, they are having contact with a lot of individuals. They probably get a lot of questions all the time from people, seniors, about what is happening, how do they get services? Um, how, how, do, how can VIA be a, a, a point of contact? I know I used to be able to find flyers and information on, on VIA buses all the time about uh, events that are happening in San Antonio. Do you see the, the VIA buses as a point of contact to provide these services? We do try to make that information available on our buses. You'll see placards refreshed on the buses at the bus stops at our transit centers. Uh, we try, because of the concerns about keeping our operators safe, we try to avoid encouraging um, conversations that are not. Yeah, now there's a big plexiglass thing around the driver, you know? <laughs> and, yeah, I guess that, that was pretty definitive. Uh, but we do have customer service windows at each of our transit centers. So we try uh, with a plexiglass, glass, but it's, there's more of an opportunity to get questions answered. Um, we have been pushing our, our customer helpline 
more around town um and the board our the via board recently set up another community group that acts as a community li liaison there are specific spots in this group reserved for um, senior residents and senior riders so this group is called the via transit community council and so as an agency, we've also been encouraging people to both serve on the council and applications are open right now uh, for the VTCC, um, but also to direct feedback to the council to um, provide that to the board and staff so that we can try to continue to improve. But it, it's absolutely a challenge uh, during a time when uh, you don't want to be encouraging that hand-to-hand -hand and face-to-face and -face contact. Cadence Corbin, we're hearing from our different partners here in the conversation talking about key areas so that we can have successful aging in place, uh, providing people transportation, providing people healthy meals at home, making sure that they can have uh, social interaction online. Uh, aging in place is something that I'm probably, I think we're going to be hearing that all the time, or at least we should be. Can you talk about how the San Antonio Area Foundation is trying to, um, is driving the conversation about successful aging in place. Yeah, so you've, you've heard from some of our uh, work group partners that work with you know, food insecurity, socialization, um, caregiving, transportation. We don't have someone here representing housing today, um, but we have a, a work group around housing as well and thinking about aging in place and universal design. Um, you know, it's an afterthought sometimes to think about the fact that people um, don't want to leave their homes, right? They they build this life, they have this identity and family and place of belonging, and then we don't create a space for that longevity of life to continue. And so now they're being moved to new places and having to learn a new community and a new way of life in a new place. Um, and so I think that across the board, we are identifying strategic ways to think about this. All of our work groups have um, outcomes and goals that they're working towards. Some of that is geared towards advocacy and policy change at a systems level. Some of that is geared towards reframing aging, changing the narrative about how we uh, identify and work alongside older adults in our community and, and the kind of world we create for them and the narrative we put out there about being fragile and vulnerable and not able to, to care for themselves. Some of that work is around um, initiative work and um, creating creating new new models of work that support our, our, our older adults, whether that's through care programs or uh, transportation models or intergenerational programs that, that organizations are working through. And so I think across the board, all of our work groups are being strategic about the work they're doing. Sometimes it just looks different from one work group to another. Our caregiver work group just put out um, a caregiver toolkit that's local, right? We have these toolkits, resources all over the internet that have these really broad clickbait information that take you to a page that don't don't really help you navigate all that well. And, and we had a, an organization take on that responsibility to help create a, a localized care, caregiver toolkit that kind of helps work through and think about what does it mean to be a caregiver and what are the steps they have to take and who are the local resources? And so, yeah, there's strategy happening across the board that creates a stronger ecosystem of support for older adults in San Antonio. So this is a community conversation and we do want input from people who are joining us online. If you have a question for a panelist, you can use the chat function on the GoToWebinar or you can email us at thesource at tpr.org. Vincent Ferris, CEO of Meals on Wheels San Antonio. The clients that y'all service, are they uh, mainly individuals who, I mean, why, why are they turning to Meals on Wheels? What's the number one driver? Uh, they are, uh, you know, have, have difficulty leaving their home uh, because they, uh, whatever, you know, could it be from, from just advanced age or to all kinds of health issues. But these are people who really are having trouble standing long enough in the kitchen to provide, uh, prepare themselves an adequate meal. And, uh, you know, the, the average age of one of our clients is north of 80, but we have some clients that are in their early 50s. Uh, on any given day of the week, we have around 20 that are just on either side of 100 years old. Uh, so it's a, it's a wide span, but a lot of, a lot of afflictions that are, are causing them issues. Uh, so many of them don't have, have caregiver support, meaning no family in the area. Uh, are they in times of COVID, families across town and can't get there? Um, it, it, is, it is really the ones that are behind the door 
that that we don't see anymore in our neighborhoods. Neighbor may be taking care of the yard, but you know, people drive by and they don't don't see the individual out like they used to. Uh, they, 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 they become silent. And so those are the ones that we are really trying to help stay in their home. Cadence referred to all the wonderful work groups that we have with the Salsa Initiative. One of the great things about San Antonio is that we have much higher home ownership by our older adults than a comparable metro area in the United States. That's good. That's great. They want to be in their homes, but it also presents other challenges. How do they take care of their homes? And so it's really all of the community nonprofits working together to help them age in place in those homes that they've known for so long. So a lot of challenges, but a lot of opportunities, David. And San Antonio has a vast geographic area. And do you just go to the city of San Antonio? What, what is your area that you serve? We actually serve nine counties. Uh, we are, are primarily in Bear County, but we extend out into Atascosa, Frio, all the surrounding counties here. Actually, we're serving meals out in Uvalde County. So uh, uh, we're, we're throughout the south, south central Texas area. And is that like a central kitchen that does all the food prep and then it's served up into containers and there's a network of, of, of wheels that deliver the meals? Yes. Talking about how things change, uh, prior to the pandemic here in San Antonio, uh, we have right at 50 neighborhood pickup points for volunteers to come and, and pick up the meals, deliver in the neighborhoods that they, they knew so well. Most of our volunteers lived in their, the neighborhood they were delivering in. And at a day's notice, we pulled the plug on that, and all of the meals in, in town had to be picked up in one location up here at 410 and Babcock. And then people were willing to you know drive out to the four corners of, of Bear County, uh, which they, they did, bless their hearts. They were absolutely wonderful. But uh, yeah, it's it, it, we cook in one spot and we we get it out through the region, sir. And so doing this, Meals on Wheels is able to really take uh, have all these contacts with individuals, and you see a, a bigger picture than many of us get. Um, what, what does that picture look like? What should we know about the community that depends on your services? These are some of the greatest people in the world. I mean, they, these are the ones that, that uh, you know, they, they taught us in school. I like to tell people they stocked our groceries, they paved our streets. I mean, they made it possible for, for all of us to be here today. And, uh, you know, that they, they have had the, the opportunity to age in place, as we're talking about. So we're, we're really giving back. Uh, they all have stories to tell. Uh, social isolation is tough. Uh, if a person, some people can choose to be isolated and don't get lonely, but those that are isolated and get lonely, that's when problem setting. Medicine no longer does what it's supposed to do. Uh, you have depression, you have all kinds of things happening there. And uh, I, I've been doing uh, Meals on Wheels for a long time, and I used to be the one standing on the table and saying, it's the food, it's the food, it's all about the nutrition, but it's really that social contact that's every bit as, as, as important. Uh, they well, need to be... They need to know that they're not forgotten and that we're here for them. It makes all the difference in the world. But, so, uh, uh, it's, it's a fascinating experience to come and deliver meals. You'll meet some wonderful people out there from behind you in, in front of your mask. Yeah, so I imagine a lot of people have little furry companions uh, to keep them company uh, throughout the day. And what do you do for them? Yes, we have an, what we call our Animals program. Uh, these, uh, you know, uh, the, the, these companion pets are, are everything. Uh, sometimes the outside of the Meals on Wheels volunteer may be the only, only other uh, individual that they have the opportunity to see and visit with during the day. Uh, we have uh, a lot of partners supporting us with pet food donations, uh, and we have pet food delivery once a month to do that uh, toward the weekend, but we... It, it gives people an opportunity to deliver that can't deliver during the week. Uh, but we were seeing clients who were giving part of their meals to their their, their furry little critters. Well, that meal wasn't good for the, the cat or the dogs. That meal wasn't created for them, but it's not good for the client either because they need the nutrition. So Animals is merely a, a support to, to those folks. Deanna Cuellar, um, at the uh, Older Adults Technology Services, OATS, and Senior Planet San Antonio. This is a national organization. You know, um, you're looking. You're the Texas State Director, so uh, a lot of uh, thinking going on involved in, in developing these programs, these training programs. 
so many different opportunities for people to learn um, how to do online banking. If you're an older person, you may be suspicious of, of taking a picture of a check and depositing it that way. Uh, I know I am. Uh, but, um, you know, this, these are services that, that actually can help people navigate their lives, maximizing what technology can do for them. They just need to be shown how to do it. Is that, is that the, the philosophy? It's definitely a team effort. Um, there's an entire curriculum team that, you know, our gerontologists, you know, specialists in digital literacy, the technology training team, our technology trainers are people who love working with seniors um, who, um, who, who really like teaching um, how to use Fitbits, iPads, you know, and at one point we were teaching seniors pre-COVID how to use a Nintendo Switch. And when I say partnership, you know, at one point at the beginning of the pandemic, there were the very first thing that we noticed within the first couple of weeks was HEB curbside delivery is it was available and um, curbside or delivery was available. But then seniors in San Antonio came to us very really quickly and said, I don't know how to use that. So we were we reached out to HEB and we got online and we 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 presented this is what we think a digital literacy how to for curbside and delivery would look like and you know and we worked together and we we troubleshooted together and we and we tried it and you know by the end of the month we had um, multiple you know from Amazon Fresh to HEB you know to Flavor like we had us you know aligned all the applications together so a senior could get online and learn the different um, different apps and we do that also when it comes to um, you know banking we work really closely with a company called Zelle um, you know and um, you know seniors can get online there's an entire curriculum all about financial security that if they, they just want to start with online safety and like what is online safety they can start there and once they get comfortable they can move into the different um, banking apps and we're trying to also do that, you know, um, as we go um, into our third year with Oats and Senior Plan San Antonio, work even closer with um, organizations like VIA. We had this huge plan, you know, for 2020, we were going to do VIA talk about it and we were going to go to senior centers and we were going to talk about how to use the VIA app. And then, you know, then COVID happens. And I, I, and I know for sure that we will pick that back up, you know, once we're able to do in-person, you know, um, demonstrations. But I think it's we're successful because you know we stop and take the time to to work with the corporate partner or the community organizations and we let the seniors the seniors feedback of like what they say they need where they're living is is the driver for which applications and devices get chosen so what we're using in san antonio texas looks different and then what like denver colorado or avenues california is focused on because it's community driven Right, and, and there needs there's a probably a greater need for bilingual uh, instruction as well. Yes, yes, it's it's um it's a plus that um you know the I, I think eighty or ninety percent of the San Antonio team are technology trainers that are also Spanish speakers, um and I mean I and I'm really proud that like out of the national network, San Antonio provides the most amount of Spanish programming right now in the country. So uh, that's a a great segue we had there for the VIA app. Uh, so Marisa Bono, I, I love the app that you guys have. You can buy your ticket on your phone, your smartphone. You can buy a pass for a month or what have you, or even for that day. And it does uh, save you time and money. Uh, and you don't have to worry about making change and all these other different hands-on type things. So the VIA app has been very successful, but I mean, uh, getting older people to be comfortable with it, can, I guess can, could be a challenge. Has that been the case? It, it absolutely is. And that's where, um, you know, Deanne makes a good point where we are in communication and a lot of we're in contact with a lot of organizations and are constantly trying to figure out how to evolve and innovate to meet the community based on what the community is saying its priorities are. And so at, um, at some point, we would really love to explore options. Um, for partnership, as, as Deanne had mentioned, to train. Um, we have um, videos and, and instructional items available on our website, and we have our customer service line. Um, but again, we, we need the help of, of groups that are already on the ground and already in contact with those uh, customers that we're trying to serve. Um, and so it's, it's uh, again, it's very challenging finding that, finding that, uh, right that right balance 
And I, I just wanted to add to something, you know, Vincent kind of alluded to something earlier about, um, you know, what we need to do to support our senior residents, but it's also important to consider what our senior residents have to offer our community. Uh, you know, I, my parents have more energy than I do. I don't know how, how they manage to keep going. And, and um, this is a time where we do need um, volunteer service, where we do need the wisdom and the expertise of our elders. And so when we figure out how to make our elders more productive citizens in our community, we're benefiting not just, just, just them, but our community as a whole as well. Yeah, so uh, Cadence Corbin, we are dealing with a society that has ageism, and we've got to figure out uh, how to get beyond that. We know people are, uh, if we're successful aging means we're going to have a lot of people who are uh, up in years, but still have a lot to offer. And, and so how do we battle that? What is the Area Foundation doing to change the narrative, make people uh, more aware that uh, ageism needs to be uh, needs to be tackled? Yeah, so it, it's a super interesting question. One, because ageism doesn't come across as a high priority for many people. They, they think in terms of ageism, it's kind of the least worry, one to worry about, um, which I think is just crazy because we have the most amount of older adults statistically than we've ever had in our, our community. And we're not thinking about how we support them and how we engage them more deeply. So the Area Foundation has um, funded an initiative uh, of, of training uh, 15 people from our community to go through the Reframing Aging Training Institute, which is a way to uh, to get community buy-in to change the narrative about how we talk about older adults, right? Everything from thinking about systems change, thinking about a justice-oriented perspective of our older adults and how we uh, create policy that, that benefits them now and for years to come. Um, and so it is, it's a hard shift to make, right? Because people are so consumed right now about worrying about their own things and getting their own stuff taken care of. And really older adults play a huge role in our community. Uh, you think about volunteerism, volunteerism is a huge, older adults make up a huge portion of volunteerism in San Antonio and beyond like nationally. Uh, they make up a huge support system for their own networks, right? And so even among older adults, how older adults support one another is really important. How they support our workforce uh, is very important. And so I think that we don't have the right language sometimes to talk about them without uh, using kind of this negative light, this negative connotation. We so how, how, they how, how they support our democracy is critical. We couldn't have the robust and secure uh, election system that we enjoy now that we need in America uh, without the uh, people who are able to work at the polls, who happen to be many of them are older Americans. Right, yeah, and I, I was reading a story just recently about a small town in Iowa who had um, an older adult community of volunteers that was 80 plus, 80 plus age volunteers were supporting the older adults in their community who maybe had less accessibility opportunities and resources. And so it was really cool, this, this woman who was 83 was like, every day I do something for myself. I walk out in my neighborhood to get fresh air, and then I take an art class online through Zoom, through my local community, and then I take Meals on Wheels to other people in my community because I know who my friends are who have their needs. You know, they're, they are aware of what their needs are. They know who their people are. They know what they, what they need and what their people need. Um, and to diminish uh, what they offer to our society is, is really frustrating. And, and so I'm looking forward to uh, the wave of reframing aging uh, here in our community, but nationally as well. And, and Ferris, Vincent, you wanted to say something? Yeah, let me jump in here. We at fairly early on in the, in the uh, COVID uh, bearing down on us, I received a call from a reporter from Alexandria, Virginia. And it was an unusual call for, I won't name the particular paper, but uh, he it was, I felt like he was just on attack mode. It wasn't a friendly trying to find out what we were doing here in San Antonio. And his point was, we had not restricted uh, our volunteers who were coming to help us uh, continue delivery of meals. Uh, it came across that he didn't think we should be using any volunteers, but then he got to the H point. Well, I assume you're turning away everyone over 65. And I said, no, we're not. And it will, shouldn't you? Why aren't you? And finally, I said, sir, I don't know if you've ever been to San Antonio or not, but there, we're a very proud community down here of a bunch of individuals. And you start talking about people's ages, you're, you're getting into ageism here. And I, I, I think some people would have a problem with that. 
And he kind of bubbed, 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 and I thought, oh, great, what have I done? You know, who knows what this, this will come out in the paper, but thank goodness he backed off of it. And he actually made a point of uh, the number of older volunteers that we had out during, during the times of COVID. But uh, yeah, it's tough. It's tough. And uh, Deanne Quayer at Oates and the uh, Senior Planet San Antonio, uh, you're providing people new technology, new solutions, but still uh, ageism exists. Are you able to help people combat that by uh, making them uh, technological savvy? We've done we've we've done a lot of work this year about ageism. But the first year we focus on like who is Senior Planet and Oats and you know what it what, you know what is this program. But you know year two again back to the South Initiative and Santa Area Foundation, uh, we launched the Social Isolation Task Force and the Social Isolation Task Force. You know with the caregiver working group, you know work together identify you know programming priorities, grant priorities. But we talked about ageism and how it's connected to loneliness. And how that you know um, you know results in all of these other you know problems and social determinants of health that our communities are experiencing. We also prior prioritize putting not just um, you know leaders of senior organizations on that task force, but we put people who were seniors and who were also activists. So you see people like Pat Hasso, um, you see people from the Joint Commission on there, uh, you see people from the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. So these were seniors who were also activists that, you know, wanted to speak up on behalf of their community. And then we also prioritize hiring older adults, and we still do, and we're, and we're going to continue to do that. So if you, you know, get online, you know, you very well might you know, be a senior being taught by another senior. Um, so, which it's really interesting too. So, if you get on there and it's it's like how to Twitter, uh, how to use Twitter, or how to use Instagram, or Canva, or, or a lot of these like new applications that people think seniors don't use, you you're you're going to very likely um, you know be introduced to um, a trainer that's you know well in their in their 70s that's using that technology and it's going to sh and show you um, how they're using um, technology. And then um, we uh, also work really really closely with us you know this is not popular but you know we really try to center the work with seniors by making sure that we speak up when seniors are not included in the design process of solutions for seniors and um you know that's uh, that's those are difficult conversations to have with people especially you know during a time like the pandemic when it's you know how quickly can we turn around you know, um, to get something out into the community. However, when you do not include people who are older, who are socially isolated, physically isolated, like Vincent talked about, like people who cannot leave their homes, we sometimes, as people who are not over 65, will will think a solution, you know, is a great idea. Um, and we're, because we're not that person with that lived experience, so we um, inadvertently, nobody's coming from a bad place, you know, we could be creating new barriers, you know, and new challenges um, for our older adult when we, we're not putting like them front and center of, you know, what the solution is. So, um, you know, really taking the time uh, to have those you know, make those phone calls, sit down with seniors in their homes, you know, talk to them and document you know, you know, their priorities and make sure their feedback is bubbling to the top, you know, to the leaders that are making decisions about them is, is crucial to the success of, of, the, of the programs we design. Yeah, we need to be thinking constantly about how does this social circumstance impact seniors, particularly seniors who are not not able to, are not as mobile, uh, like, like, like the vaccine. How are we going to get the vaccine to seniors who are not really comfortable leaving their homes? Um, we're not even sure how the vaccine is going to impact older people because the, the, that, that modeling hasn't been done yet. But, but uh, Cadence Corbin at the San Antonio Area Foundation, can you talk about the, the leadership that you all have in making sure that San Antonio's older population is represented, is being talked about, is being thought about, and has a, has a seat at the table? Correct, yes. Um, clarify your question. So how, I mean, we need um, like city leaders, county leaders, government leaders, they need to know that uh, when, you, when you propose a project, when you have a, uh, an issue, someone needs to say or be thinking, how is, this going, how is this going to impact seniors, whether directly or indirectly? And we need to be thinking about that on the front end and not on the back end. Absolutely. And I think one way we saw that 
even through COVID was when the digital divide dollars came in to address some of that work for students working at home who now had to transition to online learning. Um, Dean and Oates brought forward to our to COSA to say the digital divide goes just beyond youth, right? We have more grandparents raising grandchildren than ever before in our community. So to not think about how we act, how we create accessibility from cradle to career to to the you know to older adult older adults is just it's crazy and so when we think about solutions they have to be with the end in mind and they have to be collaborative they have to be uh, systems level they have to be from the top down and if one thing salsa has done really well this past year especially under jane's leadership is take advocacy as a serious position of our work and so we are going to our community and city leaders and we are uh, tuning into the legislative sessions and we're thinking about how does this impact our organizations, our older adults, and how do we make sure we keep, we continue to bring them to the forefront of these conversations, and not just as a special population, but as a specific uh, population all on its own. And working with nonprofits and organizations that have direct contact with seniors like uh, Meals on Wheels and Senior Planet uh, Oats, and also Via Metropolitan Transit San Antonio, uh, because they're having that one-on-one -on -one direct contact every day and they're seeing directly, can hear directly what, what's happening. Well, I wanna thank all of y'all for this uh, amazing conversation. Uh, this has been fantastic. This has been the third of our fourth community conversation centered uh, on the San Antonio Area Foundation's four impact areas, livable and resilient communities, youth success, successful aging, and cultural vibrancy. And you can join us on January 28th and 29th when we address how to foster cultural vibrancy these vital conversations have been made in collaboration with the John L. Santico's Charitable Foundation, a fund of the San Antonio Area Foundation. And again, I want to thank uh, Cadence Corbin, adults, uh, older adults program officer for the San Antonio Area Foundation, Vincent Ferris, CEO of Meals on Wheels San Antonio, Deanne Cuellar, Texas State Director for Older Adults Technology Services Oats, and Senior Planet San Antonio, Marisa Bono, Chief Strategic Officer for Via Metropolitan Transit. I'm David Martin Davies from Texas Public Radio, and thanks for joining us.